good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's 2 p.m., time to start, especially since I've only 45 minutes. <laughs> Our subject this afternoon is finance and financial markets in a free society. It's important to uh, situate and explain the, the problem of finance within a larger overall economic uh, context rather than assimilating it to a mere problem of financial markets. Uh, all too often you have the impression by reading the financial news, but also the business news in general, uh, whenever there is a problem uh, of uh, getting a company started and getting companies running and so on, that this is a problem of inadequate supply of uh, financial means through financial markets, in particular credit, but also on the stock market and so on. Now, to some extent this is justified, but on a deeper level it is uh, very strongly misleading because finance uh, is a much wider uh, phenomenon, a much wider problem than uh, the mere financial markets. So financial markets are just one means, one tool within the overall economy of solving financial problems. This is the main message that I wish to communicate in the present uh, lecture. And we'll proceed by first um, uh, giving you a few reading recommendations. And then I'll uh, come to talk about uh, the meaning of finance from a general economic uh, point of view. And then in the third step, I will discuss the various forms that finance can take in a free society. Of course, I will define what I mean by the free society uh, ahead of this. So as far as readings are concerned, um, there are a numer is of course a very um, a, a substantial literature on financial markets. There are a few textbooks uh, uh, out also uh, that have some value, but by and large the existing literature is um, deficient as far as the uh, theme of our lecture is concerned, finance from an overall point of view. If you look at uh, the standard textbooks, for example, Frederick Mishkin's uh, Money, uh, Banking and Financial Markets, uh, you will see that what he discusses under the rubric of financial markets is essentially an introduction to financial institutions as they are, uh, as we have them today. And there is some discussions of basic financial mechanisms, in particular as far as uh, central prices such as the interest rate or the foreign exchange rate and so on are concerned. But there's no discussion of uh, financial markets within the overall economy and as, and as uh, for, uh, no comparison of financial markets as uh, related to other, or in contrast to other uh, forms of finance within a financial within a modern economy. So um, this is then one of my ongoing research projects. My, my next publication will be a book on the political economy of finance, and I hope to get this done uh, next year, to have it published next year. So it will be published by the Mises Institute. Um, meanwhile, to get some rough idea of where I'm heading to, you can have a look at two English language texts that are published uh, last year, and there's more forthcoming this year. Uh, so this uh, article, and we have a second article, which is uh, presently only a working paper. Uh, this article also still exists as a working paper version for those of you who um, uh, do not have the financial means to acquire the book. Then we have, uh, as far as the Austrian literature is concerned, uh, a classic uh, text by uh, Fritz Maklub, uh, The Stock Market Credit and Capital Formation a book that was first published in German in 1931 um, as the habilitation thesis of Fritz Maklop, and Ludwig von Mises was his advisor, and he liked the book very much. And then eventually an English version came out in 1940, and Mises liked this book a little less, and I will. Uh, there, there are good reasons to like it a little less, because it fails in precisely in respect to uh, the, the problem that I mentioned already, which is central to, to my lecture. Mises and Rothbard themselves did not uh, con bestow any considerable attention to financial markets. You find occasional remarks here and there in Mises' books, uh, as far as financial markets is concerned, and the same thing for Rothbard. Now, uh, this has a lot to do with the fact that during uh, most of their lifetime, and especially uh, in, after, in the time after World War I, financial markets uh, led most of the time a rather secondary existence uh, within the overall economy, so they were by no means as important as they uh, are today and have become in the course of the past 30 years. 
So in a way, right, uh, when you write a, a, a treatise on economics, of course, you try to deal with those subjects that are somehow important in the world as, as you know it. And uh, in those uh, years, especially after World War II and until 1980, roughly, uh, financial markets were not very important. Of course, the same thing holds true for the uh, war years. So in Mises and Rothbard, we don't find much, uh, especially not much systematic on uh, financial markets. Then we have two mainstream texts that I also recommend, which are uh, McKinnon and, and Shaw, uh, writing in the, or publishing in the same year, uh, and both uh, dealing with uh, the financial causes of economic underdevelopment. Uh, so the, these were, this was the heyday of the development economics literature. And Shaw and McKinnon uh, argued that uh, part of this um, plight of the underdeveloped uh, countries was due to the fact that financial markets were not sufficiently well uh, developed. So this is a very Keynesian uh, way of, of, of looking uh, at, the, at the world and looking at the economy. Uh, so the general idea is that, we, uh, that, that the spending of money is the driving engine of the economy. So the more we spend and the faster we spend, uh, the better it is for the economy. We are lubricating the economy, and more than this, we are creating revenues, and these revenues can then be spent elsewhere, so create second round uh, revenues, and so on. So on. this is the Keynesian story. Now, their variant of this was uh, to say, well, if financial markets are underdeveloped, well, then the only way to uh, use your savings or to create savings uh, uh, is cash hoarding. And cash hoarding in those countries is generally uh, not uh, possible either. Uh, because they are very inflationary, so people save in very inadequate and inefficient ways. For example, um, a farmer might ac acquire a second tractor that he does not really need, but it's a way of acquiring a durable economic uh, good that will uh, store value, so to say, over time. Right? So uh, the way out of this is to create, first of all, uh, a stable money, and then uh, thereby encourage uh, deposits in the banking system, whereby in turn, uh, through the fractional reserve principle, about which you just heard just a lecture, uh, we, are, we can expect to uh, multiply uh, credits uh, bestowed within the economy, so there will be more spending going on, and you have the Keynesian story uh, again. So why do I recommend this? Well, because it's a particularly clear exposition of the Keynesian vision of financial markets, and which has uh, come... Uh, back to the forefront of current discussion about five years ago uh, in the context of increasing financial regulation, so what McKinnon and Shaw called at the time financial repression, which has become important again. So let's move on to a, a definition, a general definition of finance. To finance means to provide the means necessary to accomplish a human activity. Because when we think of finance, we, we think of money, right? because we are used to uh, live in a monetary economy, so that's all good and, uh, and, and right. But uh, money is just a means of exchange, it's an intermediary of um, uh, human co cooperation. Um, and as we know, right, we can, if we increase the money supply too fast, and this money becomes uh, valueless because we have the law of diminishing marginal utility. The more money you have, right, the, the less value any unit of this larger stock has. And, uh, and so uh, we even risk the, uh, that the market participants reject that money completely. So just having more money does not necess necessarily mean having greater means of, of finance. So money is a way to finance activities only to the extent that it pro uh, provides us with real purchasing power, that it enables us to buy things, uh, non-monetary non goods, that we can buy. And what we need to buy in particular are those goods that keep human beings going. Right? This is the most important um, way to finance a unique, uh, human activity, is to provide consumer goods for the persons who are involved in activities they do not create themselves the consumer goods that they need to survive. So therefore, uh, we can even narrow this definition down and say what needs to be financed, are especially those activities that do not nourish the human person engaged in them. So for a hunter and gatherer, right, we can imagine that at the end of the day, he has, through his activity, acquired all those consumer goods, berries and 
uh, dead rabbits and, and whatever, that he will need right, to fill up uh, uh, his body and make it through the next day again. Right? So this activity, therefore, does not need finance in the strict way, except if you say, well, I need to finance my energies right, today out of the consumption of yesterday evening or something like this. Right? So this is correct. But in a developed economy, we have lots of activities that uh, do not aim at creating immediately consumable goods, but that take part of the division of labor, and therefore create goods that are of no or negligible uh, immediate use for the person who is concerned. And so if you're an accountant, you do not produce anything that, is, that you could eat or sleep in and so on at the end of the day. If you're an economics teacher, it's the same thing. Even if you're uh, engaged, uh, let's say, in a, in a factory and you're producing cars and so on, you cannot, uh, you're producing maybe just a, a car door or something of this sort, and you could not uh, eat or sleep in or, and cloth yourself with this car door at the end of the day. So how do these people make it through time? They make it through time by being able to obtain consumer goods. And so we finance them by providing consumer goods to them. This is the most basic form of finance. What needs to be financed truly is always human activity. And last year somebody said, well, but we also have animals. Okay, animals. <laughs> right? Most animals, by the way, can feed themselves. We should just let them roam and so on. So we do not need to make any special precautions on that behalf. But sometimes it's true, we need to feed animals as well. Right? So what needs to be financed uh, are the activities of living beings and human beings uh, in particular. We do not need to finance inanimate objects, inanimate economic goods. Uh, sometimes we say, in colloquial language, well, we need to finance the acquisition of this and that machine, or this and that car, or this and that building. Now, this is a, 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 everybody understands perfectly what is meant by this, but uh, the economic, economic substance, really, what needs to be financed is not the house per se. The house is there. It does not need any finance. It's just there. It belongs to somebody, it's true. Right? So what we need to, to finance is, from a general economic point of view, is the activity of the people who uh, build the house and who want to uh, keep going. So maybe they are specialized in house building and so on. So what we do by handing over money to them, we enable them to make it through the next rounds of their life and continue leading a productive life. So objects, uh, economic goods, inanimate economic goods, do not need finance uh, from an overall point of view. Right? What always needs finance are human activities. Now, in a free society, The, these means uh, that uh, are necessary to accomplish human activities come out of savings. And savings, as you know, uh, uh, is, is this part of uh, current revenue that is not currently consumed. Right? So it's, uh, it's always this trade off with, with consumption. Um, In a society that is, uh, there is also another form of savings about which I will say a few words later on, namely the production of money. Right? So you can also uh, use, as far as monetary finance is concerned, you can use freshly produced uh, units of money to finance human activities. But in a free society, by and large, savings dominate. So we will focus on uh, the, the meaning of savings. Um, why are savings so important? Well, we can explain it in uh, contrasting savings to consumption. What, what does consumption mean from an economic point of view? What, does con what, what is consumption? What does it mean to consume something? To enjoy services. To enjoy services? To enjoy services? Okay, but... Okay. It's not correct because you can enjoy, for example, the look of, of a landscape or something like that. You're not consuming the landscape. Right. Thank you, sir. You extinguish. Right? You, you destroy the economic good. More precisely, what we do is to destroy the value of that economic good. 
So strictly speaking, we human beings, we sometimes we imagine we have, but really, truly, we do not have the power to destroy any material object whatsoever. What we do is to transform it. Right? We can transform uh, this uh, piece of furniture by burning it, for example, so it is transformed in a heap of ash and so on, and then various gases that come out of it. Right? So we do not really destroy the substance, we transform it in, an, in another form, that has less value than the form it had before. Right? And the same thing holds, of course, also for consumer goods. I won't go into, into detail, right? but it's the same thing. We transform them into objects that have much less value for us, that are actually economic bads for most cases. Right? So to consume means to destroy. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, a German economist, always when he tried to refute the uh, Keynesian uh, approach to uh, wealth creation, he always said, well, you, you cannot enrich yourself by consumption. It's just a matter of definition. Right? You know, to consume means to destroy. You cannot become richer by destroying things. It's impossible. So if we encourage uh, consumption, we do not become richer. We actually become poorer. Right? What you want uh, to do if you want to uh, set an eco uh, economy on a wealth-creating path on a, on a growth path, you want to encourage the opposite of, uh, of consumption, which is uh, then saving. You want to have people produce a lot and not save a lot. Right. By producing a lot not saving, uh, and not uh, con uh, consuming a lot, uh, you can accumulate um, economic goods that increase your productive abilities in the future. Right? You can build up capital goods, you can build up infrastructure of, of all kinds, machines and so on, which will facilitate production in the future. Right? And this is, in fact, how invariably how a growth process works out. So savings enable us to uh, perform what Austrian economists since Böhm Warwerk have called roundabout production. And so it's a term that you are now familiar with. Right? So roundabout production means uh, to, to increase the roundaboutness of production means that I reduce that part of labor dedicated to the creation of currently consumable goods, and that I increase that proportion of labor dedicated to the production of uh, capital goods, so goods that will help me to increase production in the future. Right? So savings do that. The more savings we have, the more roundabout our production processes can be. Therefore, the higher is the productive potential in the future. Of course, this comes at, at the cost of reducing consumption in the present. Right? So if we dedicate less labor and less other resources on the production of consumer goods, well, of course, we will consume less goods in the present. That is, at least, less than we otherwise could have, uh, could have used. Savings also enable us to uh, engage in research and development. So it's uh, absolutely fundamental for uh, uh, technological, what is called technological progress. Right? So very few great ideas and actually no product springs out of thin air just by an idea like this, uh, just like by a brilliant uh, insight that comes like, uh, like this. And sometimes a great idea may be okay, yes. But even then, right, if you have a great idea, maybe the theory of relativity, the theory of uh, the time preference theory of interest and so on might have come as a struck of lightning, but then in order to elaborate the theory, you actually need to spend a lot of time. So then the question is again, how do you survive all those days and weeks and years that you dedicate to developing this theory? And the answer is, there is no other means than having savings at your disposition. Either your own savings or the savings of other people that they use for you so that you can engage as a scientist or as a researcher on the production of a theory or an engineer on the production of a prototype of a product. It takes a lot of savings. So more, the more savings we have, the greater is the rate of technological progress. And finally, the division of labor, about which you had a lecture yesterday, is also indirectly dependent on uh, the accumulation of capital, because the more roundabout our capital structure becomes, so the more roundabout the production process is, uh, the more distinct uh, productive uh, steps take place, and so therefore the uh, opportunities for specialization increase. If you have a very primitive economy, 
no savings, no capital good production whatsoever. The only way to specialize is uh, in the production of the various consumer goods that can be immediately created just with your hands. You can become a hunter, you can become a fisher, you can become a caretaker of old people or ch children and so on. By and large, that's it. A few other things. Right? But as capital as, uh, is being accumulated, yes, uh, right? so more activities, more other types of activities become possible. Right? <laughs> And so you have uh, the production of machines, you have the production of various equipment. So all these are uh, different opportunities for specialization. And eventually you get accountants, you get lawyers, you get law economists, and so on and so on. Right? All these specializations are only possible if the economy becomes more and more roundabout, which is only possible if we have more savings. So this is how this, uh, this works in, um, in a free society. Now... What distinguishes a free society from an interventionist society, which is, of course, what we currently have, uh, we need to uh, make uh, an assumption. Well, well, first of all, we need to uh, define what a free society is. In a, in a perfectly free society, all uh, social interaction would be based on the respect of property rights, of private property rights. Okay, so this is the definition that the economists in the, in the 19th century used, right? Frederick Bastiat. Uh, various other uh, economists, and then of course Ludwig von Mises took up the same thing, and Murray Rothbard, and present-day Austrian economists as well. Right? So what distinguishes a, a free society is uh, that uh, there's a perfect, a perfectly free society would be a society in which the only uh, private law principles would apply. That is, you have perfect respect for <coughs> private property rights. As soon as we have something. Uh, uh, like a government in place, we get institutionalized partial violations of property rights. And so we get interventionist regimes. Now, this is just an analytical distinction. It uh, does not yet answer the, the question whether such institutionalized uh, dis uh, interventions are sometimes necessary. Uh, it's a different question. Um, but what we do in economics is to analyze the consequences that follow from uh, interventions, that is, from violations of property rights. And that, that is what I will do in uh, my lecture on Thursday, uh, also dealing with finance in an interventionist regime this time. So in a free society, we have no institutionalized violations of private property rights. And in particular, we also have a free monetary system that is the government does not intervene in uh, the production and in the use of money. Now, in such a, a situation, there is a strong tendency for, uh, a certain, for the emergence of a certain type of a monetary system. Right? We, uh, most notably, we get uh, the emergence of a commodity money-based uh, system. That is, uh, people would use uh, commodities that are particularly suitable for the use as a medium of exchange. Historically, this has been the case uh, with precious metals. So precious metals are most likely to be used in such a setting. We cannot exclude from the outset also that there might be product innovation, so other types of money might be developed. Uh, Bitcoin is usually brought up in this context. Yes, from a theoretical point of view, definitely that would be a possibility because what distinguishes Bitcoin from the currently uh, uh, immaterial monies that we have, which are fiat monies, is that Bitcoin, by the logic of its uh, operation, has a limitation inbuilt uh, in, in its very nature. So the, the principle of Bitcoin, the idea of Bitcoin, is that you cannot produce more than a certain quantity of it, that you have uh, exponentially increasing production costs. That's the idea. Right? So the idea, of course, might be wrong. Maybe it's possible to hack the code of Bitcoin and so on. I'm not enough of an IT expert to answer this question. But let's say if the idea could be perfectly realized, then of course Bitcoin might be a suitable medium of exchange also for a free society. But the crucial point is then the following. All free market monies have this in common, that, they are, uh, that the amount of, of them which you can create uh, spontaneously is not subject to human arbitrary will, uh, which is the crucial difference as compared to the present fiat money systems that dominate the world economy. Right? Fiat money, in the strict sense, is a money that can be created ad libitum. Uh, 
the authorities can create as much of it as they wish. They can double the money supply from one day to the other, or triple it, or quintuple it, and whatever. Right? In, even from one second to another. And on a free market, of course, people would tend not to use, because, I mean, this is very convenient for the people who produce the money. It gives them great power. So it's a desirable money from the point of view of the money producers. It's not a desirable money from the point of view of a money user. And as a money user, you would wish to have a medium of exchange that has, so to say, institutional safeguards and institutional in, uh, insurance that it not be multiplied and to such an extent that it lose its value. And so people would tend to prefer precious metals because they're costly to produce. It's not an advantage. It's precisely the institutional safeguard against excessive production. Right? And they might also use uh, bitcoins for exactly the same reason, because there might be institutional safeguards against excessive production of bitcoins. So what does this mean? And then in a free society, um, there would be a distinct tendency for the money supply uh, to grow at a relatively slow pace. In any case, it might grow at a much slower pace than the rest of the economy. This is what we uh, had uh, in the Anglo-Saxon countries in the, in the 19th century and, uh, and even up to World War I. And it's a similar situation that we also had in most European countries um, in the last third of the 19th century. And in that historical experience, right, the money supply grew, but it grew at a much lower pace than the rest of the economy. And the consequence was then uh, an environment in which prices tended to fall. And right? we had what is called today uh, deflationary growth, price deflationary growth. Okay. So the point is, if we have a free society, there is a tendency uh, for growth to be price deflationary. <coughs> Free society means a tendency for a diminishing price level. And this is very important if we think of, or when we think of financial markets, as I will more fully explain in a few minutes. And so this needs to be kept in, our, in the back of our heads. Now, what are, what are the forms of finance in such a free monetary economy? There are three main forms that we need to distinguish. The first one is what McKinnon and Shaw have called self-finance. Not a perfectly nice expression, but we'll, we'll use it because it's already there in the literature. So self-finance finance means that I myself, as the saver, am the user also of those savings. So I've saved in a monetary economy by accumulating cash. Right? So this is what I do. It's the first and elementary form of savings. And now I can use uh, this form of cash in two uh, ways. I can spend it on the goods that I need for myself. Let's say I'm a consultant, a service provider, and so on. Then I use my savings to finance my current consumption. Right? So I buy foodstuff and so on, but I also buy means of transport, uh, housing, clothing, and so on. So, so I use my savings to uh, get myself through the months during which I'm engaged in a production process and until I'm being paid, living out of my own savings. The other way to use those savings is to um, uh, spend them on factors of production produced by other people uh, or owned by other people. I might buy a machine. I might, re might rent a machine. I uh, might buy a computer. Almost certainly today I would buy a computer. I might rent office space. I might hire people, I might hire, have employees, and so on. So in these ways, then I use my own savings on uh, uh, those factors of production that I acquire to produce whatever product. Now, it's clear, um, well, maybe it's not clear, so I should stress that an economy could operate entirely on the basis of self-finance. Um, so it's not necessarily necessary to have financial markets. Right? You could operate an economy entirely on this principle. Right? It's possible. If everybody is his, his own entrepreneur, uh, or maybe employee, right? you could uh, work or operate on, on this principle. Now, that's uh, 
uh, not what we do, and there are good reasons why self-finance exists in our developed economy, but it does not uh, monopolize the scene, and it's not even dominant. Right? Uh, what are the reasons? What are the limitations of self-finance in a free economy? Well, the limitations uh, are, again, three in numbers, but this is my little scheme. You might find other ways to, to cut this up and come up with a different number. Right? So a first limitation is that um, in the case of self-finance, we have a limitation of the intellectual division of labor. Right? You can set up a, a company or some productive venture only if you yourself have the savings. So you need to have the ideas, you need to have the drive, the initiative, and so on, and you need to have the savings. And if the savings are lacking, well, and even though you might have drive and you are young, you have lots of ideas and so on, you could not set up a company. So clearly this is a limitation. Second, there is no financial division of labor. Now this is a Hultzman expression, right? So you wouldn't find this in the literature. It's a financial division of labor. What does this mean? Well, it means that there is a separation between the people who, you, who save and the people who use the savings, right? which is, of course, characteristic for financial markets. Right? So in a self -finance, purely self-financed economy, most people would only save for themselves. There's, in fact, only one part of the population that indirectly, or, well, indirectly, that, that saves immediately for other people, for the immediate benefit of other people. Who are these people? How do we call them? Parents. Parents. <laughs> oh, wow, this is a good one. I didn't think of this. Yeah, OK, two, two groups. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so caretakers and so on. Who was the other one? Yeah. Entrepreneurs. Capitalist entrepreneurs. Uh, the capitalist entrepreneur, he, he creates, let's say you have a car maker, uh, a car manufacturer. He sets up his car manufacturing firm. So he buys, I mean, he himself, he might, of course, he's also interested in, in riding a car and so on, but he's going uh, to, to produce hundreds of thousands of cars and so on. So much more than he personally needs. So he starts hiring people. He starts buying raw materials. He starts buying specialized equipment and so on, not for his own immediate interest, but for the benefit of other people, for the immediate benefit of other people. Because at the end of the day, at the, or at the end of the year, whatever his production period is, he has all these cars, which he cannot really use. Right. So he will provide a benefit to other people. If they don't like the cars, he will just dump them at very low prices. So that's great for them. And he has to stop his, his firm, right, because there's no way going forward. Right. So he has provided a service to other people in the hope, of course, that he be remunerated at a price high enough to make this whole thing worthwhile for him. Right? So the ultimate beneficiary is, of course, himself and, and his family and so on. Right? So that's the hope. But the immediate beneficiary is always the customer. Right? So in a self-financed economy, only entrepreneurs save directly for other people, which is a limitation. So there's no financial division of labor. The people who save, also the people who invest. And the third limitation is that, is related to the first one, is that the use of capital tends to be relatively inefficient. Right? Because precisely because you can only invest when you have yourself savings and the ideas. Right? It follows that in some areas there might be overinvestment. Right? because people just tend to invest again and again in a line of production that they are already pursuing, with which they are familiar and so on. So even though the return on investment is relatively low, which means that the market is already relatively saturated, they might still go on investing there. Whereas in other areas where there are also uh, uh, human needs, right? we have huge returns on investment, but nobody's investing there, either because the capital is lacking or because the specialized knowledge is lacking. So these are the limitations of a self-financed economy. And out of these limitations, we can then uh, uh, explain why it comes to the development of financial markets. Financial markets uh, help to partially overcome these limitations. Right? 
A financial market can be defined as an exchange of, promise, of a promise of a future payment. It's a financial exchange. As somebody who hands over money, and what he receives in exchange is a promise. Okay, that's a financial market. So he buys a promise. This is unusual to think this way, but this is how economists think. He buys a promise. And the other person is buying what he's buying, savings of the person who hands over the money. Because clearly that money is not consumed by the person himself or herself. He hands over the, the, the money, the savings are sold, and a promise is bought. And the, the person who uses those savings, he buys the savings with a promise. Of course, promises are cheap, as we, as we say, right? So therefore, the things are not quite as easy as that. Of course, you don't just promise anything. Right? So usually we take great care in selecting carefully whom we can entrust our savings, right? It must be a trustworthy person and so on. And in fact, much uh, right, a reputation or trust has to be produced in many ways, just as any other economic good. It's a precious economic good. Uh, it must be trustworthy, and trustworthiness can be produced uh, by using... First of all, always by keeping promises that you've given in the, in the present, by being transparent and so on. We won't, do not need to go into this. Right? And then by additional guarantees and so on. Right? So we have, um, uh, on the markets, we have, uh, as, as a rule, right, we do not have oral promises. We have, as a rule, f uh, written promises. So, so we call them financial titles. Uh, and most of these titles are actually backed up with uh, additional um, uh, institutional safeguards, for example, uh, securities, insurance contracts, uh, 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 third-party guarantee, and so on. And if they are so protected with various other uh, surrounding institutional safeguards, we call them securities. So what is being exchanged on a stock exchange is a financial title, but more narrowly, it is a security. Right? But this is all uh, of secondary importance for us. So what's the impact of financial markets on uh, an economy? What's the overall impact of financial markets? Now, as one error that needs to be avoided is that the financial markets make us per se richer. Okay? It's not because you have an exchange of, of savings that anything has improved from an overall point of view. Right? It's just you hand over your savings to this other person. Okay, you, have, you don't have your savings anymore at your disposition, but this other person has. So the society per se, society as a whole, has not become richer. What changes, therefore, in the immediate run through financial markets is the um, allocation of resources. That's the te technical expression uh, in economics, the allocation of resources. It changes the way we use the available resources. If I hand over my savings to an entrepreneur, rather than using them myself, right, it means that he now can buy specialized equipment, in fact, uh, hire people and so on, rent office space, whereas in the other way around, I might have maybe set up my own firm, so I would hire, have hired people, but other people. I would have bought specialized equipment, but other types, sorts of equipment. I would have rented office space, but not necessarily at the same place as he did. Right. So what financial markets do is to change the way resources are being used. People are working for him now rather than for other people. If I hand out a consumer credit, right, it means that the benefiting household is now able to buy a nice house, rent a nice apartment, or buy a nice apartment, buy a big car, and so on. Whereas in the absence of that credit, other people would have used the same house, other people would have bought the, the same car, et cetera, et cetera, only at lower prices. Right? Because what the financial exchange does is to enable certain people to, uh, to have more money so they can uh, bid up the prices to obtain the resources that otherwise would have gone to other people. Right? So they do not make society as a whole richer, they change the way the resources, the available resources are being used. So financial markets can have an impact, not in the immediate run, but only in the long run, uh, because this use of resources uh, 
might be better. But there's also a second uh, reason why financial markets tend to improve the productive abilities of an economy in the long run, namely because they encourage savings. Okay. In a financial exchange, typically you do not uh, say, well, uh, I bum it by, by your promise, and your promise is, well, I'll give you back the money exactly the same amount one year later or one month later. Right? Typically, the person who promises, promises not only the restitution of the sum of money that he has obtained, but uh, the payment of a remuneration, uh, often called interest rate uh, or profit or whatever. So there is the expectation, there's the hope for a remuneration of our savings by handing it over to somebody else. And this remuneration is, of course, a powerful incentive to save more. And as a consequence, then financial markets bring into place what uh, I've called the financial division of labor. Um, it's not something that nobody has known before me. I've just used this expression. It's a weird expression, financial division of labor. But truly, that's what it is. Right. So now people who are not themselves entrepreneurs, start saving for the immediate benefit of other people. This, they might specialize in saving. Some households are good at living a frugal life. They're not particularly brilliant and uh, agile and, and so on, would not be good entrepreneurs, but they can lead a frugal life, so they specialize in, in saving. And thereby enable other people to use those savings to produce something. So this is truly, right? so these are the, the, the two uh, uh, mechanisms through which financial markets might have a beneficial impact on the overall economy. Uh, they might create a better use, or put into place a, a better use of the available resources, but I consider to be this, without giving you a numerical quantitative expression, but I consider to, uh, this to be the relatively less important mechanism. The more important one is the second one. Uh, financial markets encourage savings. Uh, so people tend to save more than without financial markets. If we com compare two economies that are equal in every respect, except for the presence of financial markets in the one and the absence of financial markets in the other, then savings would tend to be higher in the first one that has financial markets uh, because there are these strong incentives to save. Okay, what are the limitations of financial markets? In a free society, again, there are three. <laughs> I don't have an obsession with the number of three, but, but it turned out to be three. Right? So, but again, right, you, it's, it's a non-exhaustive list. You might come up with additional limitations or correct me on one of them. So I think there are, there are three main limitations. The first one comes with the disadvantages uh, of financial markets that we all know. First of all, we become dependent on other people. Right? This is, of course, a big off. Uh, and we hand over our savings to somebody else. We become dependent on that person. If we kept it in cash, it would not be a perfectly secure solution either because we might be robbed. Right? So there's nothing perfectly safe. Right? There's no such thing in the world. Right? But at least we might, be, we might feel to be in full control of our savings. If we invest on the, as we buy a financial product, um, a promise, a specialized promise to pay, we become dependent on that other people, these other persons. So even if they are not frauds, right, they might be wrong in their judgment. Right? The, the thing, the, the, the venture in which they're engaging just turns out bad. Right? It's possible. But then, of course, they might also be frauds. Right? <laughs> and there are lots of those on financial markets. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a big limitation. So therefore, people tend to hold back and then uh, go buy a financial title only if there are very propitious circumstances. The second limitation is that in a free society, there is a tendency for the rate of return on the investment of capital to decline in a, in a growing economy. The more capital we accumulate, uh, the lower is the return on capital. This is, again, the law of diminishing marginal value. Right? The more plentiful any good becomes, the more plentiful savings become, right? the lower is their value. So the return on capital would decline. Of course, in practice, right, there are also countervailing forces. There are other things that might happen. There might be technological progress, and as a consequence for a while, right, the, the return on capital might be 
increase because suddenly with this new technology you need lots of capital to produce the specialized equipment and so on. Uh, there's not enough capital there, so capital becomes scarce again, so the rates of return go up. Okay, so this was, but ceteris paribus, uh, all other things being equal, there is a tendency with the accumulation of capital for returns to decline. Now, if the returns on capital decline, then of course a financial exchange becomes comparatively less interesting than just keeping the money in cash, right? Because let's say the rate of return is 0.5%. We're almost heading there thanks to our central banks, okay? All right, so then there's a huge incentive to just keep the, uh, the, cash in, in, uh, the, the, the savings in cash rather than handing them over to somebody else and risking that, uh, to be exposed to a fraud or to an incompetent manager and so on. Right? Now, in a free society, there would be this tendency. Therefore, there is an in increasing tendency for um, the hoarding of cash to grow relative to financial markets. Okay. The third limitation, and it's uh, related to this, is that in a free society, for the reasons that I've mentioned at the beginning of my lecture, the price level would tend to decline. A free society, a growing free society, is uh, a society uh, exposed to deflationary growth. Now, if prices, the price level declines, it means uh, that by just holding cash, Right, you obtain a real return on your savings. So again, right, savings in the form of cash are benefited at the expense of savings in the form of financial exchanges. Okay. So financial markets in a free society would not grow over proportionally. They, they would be a very strong limitation to the growth of financial markets within a free society. Now, this brings us to the last form, which is cash hoarding. Now, I've just said, so there's very strong tendencies for cash hoarding to become ever more important relative to financial markets and relative, of course, also to self-finance in a free society. And uh, this is considered by Keynesian economists, but in fact today by most economists because they are very strongly uh, inspired by, by Keynesian-type reasoning, as a, a devastating critique of a free market economy as far as finance is concerned. Because they reason as follow, well, we need um, um, financial markets to make it possible that one group of person who does not save uh, themselves benefit from the savings of other people. So the only way for this group to benefit from the savings of another group is through a financial exchange. So if people hoard ever more cash, right, we are suffocating this financial division of labor, and as a consequence, we are reverting back to the disadvantages of, of self-finance. Okay. So therefore, we need government interventionism. We need government to intervene in the economy in order to stimulate the production of money. Uh, so that the price level would no longer tend to decline, but rather increase, so as to discourage cash hoarding, uh, which is exactly what we read today in the press uh, communiques of, uh, of our central banks. And they aim at a positive price inflation rate in order to discourage the hoarding of cash. Um, and this in order to well, stimulate the spending of money. So we need to look into this. And if we look into this just a little bit, we find that the, this uh, sort of reasoning is unfounded right? because uh, the hoarding of cash has, in fact, structurally the same impact as a financial exchange. The hoarding of cash reduces the amount of money being exchanged in the economy. So money becomes more scarce relative to the other goods. But this means, then, that money prices will diminish. Right? less money will be exchanged for a given non-monetary good. Right? Increased hoarding of cash, therefore, has the consequence of reinforcing uh, the reduction of the price level. Now, this means that, of course, each unit of money will have a higher purchasing power than it would otherwise have had. Right? 
if before the price level was whatever, uh, 100, and now it diminishes to, to 50, then with each dollar you can buy twice as many goods as before. Now this implies that if people hoard cash, right, the beneficiaries will be other people. If you hoard cash, there's a tendency for the price level to decline. Right? Therefore, the money that is being used by other people will have a higher purchasing power. So this boils down to being the same situation as the one that would have obtained if you had handed over a, a credit to some, uh, some other person. Right? Rather than saving cash, you had handed the money over uh, in the form of a credit, so this person would have been able to buy more. Now you save in cash, and as a consequence, the price level declines, so other people can buy more. It's the same thing. Right? So it's not the case that uh, cash hoarding suffocates the economy, that it deprives uh, the economy of, uh, uh, of finance. It's, it's a very subtle way of financing the activities of one group by the savings of another group, but it's there nevertheless. There are two main differences between financial markets and hoarding. Again, so they are similar in, from a structural point of view. Both allow for interpersonal finance, savings of group one, save, uh, finance the activities of another group B. They're different in two respects that are related. Most notably, as we have already seen, financial markets remunerate savings. Right? So as a consequence, then, there is a greater incentive right, to, uh, to save through financial markets. But they remunerate savings because uh, financial markets allow us to uh, target the beneficiary of our savings. If I save in cash, right, there is a general tendency for prices to decline. But nobody can tell exactly which prices will decline to which extent. And the impact of each of the beneficiaries will t tend to be marginally, that is, infinitesimally small. So there's no way of being remunerated for this. But financial markets allow me to target my savings, target the, uh, on, on a given beneficiary. And this allows, uh, uh, makes it possible to be remunerated. Right? But again, from a structural point of view, there is no, no difference. So in conclusion then, now I've spoken more than 45 minutes, but thank you for your patience. All right, so in, in conclusion then, right, uh, in, in a free society, financial markets would fulfill uh, an important role. There would be one element, uh, one important mechanism for the transmission of savings from one group of persons to another group, would therefore play a by not a beneficial role within society, but they would be limited. Right? It would not be the only way to uh, accomplish this task. Uh, and, in fact, would uh, tend to become less important as the economy becomes uh, more important. Thank you for your attention.